Hello, everyone. Welcome to episode 11 of season one of In the Art Scene. I'm Ron Marcus, and my co host is. Hey, I'm Galena Marcus. Today, we are speaking with someone long awaited, meaning we have been waiting a long time to speak with her, and we finally got to speak with her. Her name is Galena. What is her name? Her name is Angelique Bacha, and she will introduce herself and even tell us a little bit about where the name comes from. But the cool thing about this is not only she was the long waited uh, to come to our podcast, originally, a couple of years ago, Angelique and I were talking about starting a podcast ourselves. And, and I, then I jumped in and I stole her place. No, I'm thinking about actually extending uh, an invitation to her and maybe start another podcast where two artists are just talking about art things she doesn't know oh, that yet but she she's going to hear this episode for the first time just <laughs> like you and she's going to be what i'll yeah. make sure to talk to her about it <laughs> now that's how we recruit all our talent okay and she's got a cool story for a couple of reasons so like many of our guests she has a day job she does this at uh, night and weekends and whatnot uh, but she's very serious about it. It isn't just a side thing. It's actually a, a main thing alongside her other main thing, which is a regular job. She paints on giant canvases. She does abstract art and she's getting ready to move. Actually, she's already done it by the time this uh, has aired. She has moved to Europe. So she's going to be an expat doing her art over there. We're going to be talking about that. We're going to be talking about how art brings value to the world. So stick around for that. Okay, let's get started. So happy Sunday to you both. Welcome back. Happy, happy Sunday. <laughs> for those of you that don't know where we came back from, we just had a week off in Sedona, Arizona and had a fabulous time didn't we we did yes we did indeed we did indeed indeed yes so we're back and we're back to in the art scene and we have a special guest today we're talking with angelique bacha say that name again angelique bacha is that correct that is correct yes you said it perfectly i didn't want to butcher your name angelique so i let galena do it <laughs> with my Eastern European accent, right? Yeah. Right, perfect. Well, with so my... Angelique, you can tell us where the name comes from. I have no idea. It's not Polish, even though my husband is from Poland. The the last name isn't Polish as far as we can tell. We're not sure. I I, I can't remember where his dad said it was from. I don't even know if it's no, it has to be Slavic. It has to be. But apparently it means chief of the tribe. Or something like that, and in ironically, in Italian, it means kisses. Oh, oh, bacio, bacio. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that word I know. Yeah, so. I um, I meet people sometimes when when I introduce myself by the first name, they are asking me if I am Italian because Galina was double L in Italian means chicken. Chicken. <laughs> yes, and I'm like oh, no, 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 there's one L. <laughs> That's not a name you want to have. <laughs> Well, I'm definitely not moving to Italy. <laughs> well, we have a, a funny name story, and then we'll get into the meat of this podcast. So my great-grandfather's last name was Podiast, and he was from Poland when it was still part of Russia, and he came over at the turn of the 20th century. And uh, his name got changed because the customs agent apparently couldn't understand him when he said Podiast. So, <laughs> shocking, right? <laughs> shocking. So he said, mark it down. And so he wrote Marcus down, but but it gets better. So. My grandfather always believed that the word podiast means the wanderer. And he liked it so much that when he retired and bought a, a, a motor home for he and his wife to travel the country, they called it the podiast. Oh, <laughs> when they bought a Fun. second one, they called it the podiast too. So some years later, after my grandparents have passed away, I'm talking with my Polish friend and I tell him that podiast means the wanderer and he busts out laughing and he says, that's not what it means. And I said, well, what does podiast mean? It says it means the long driveway up to the manor. It's a driveway. <laughs> yeah. It's a driveway. And I guess apparently Russian it's, Slavic, it also means driveway. It, yeah, it's a very similar word in Russian. I'd be curious what your husband says about the word podiast. I will ask him when he's done with his call. Find out. Maybe in Silesia, they have a completely different definition of podiast. I don't know. 
Well, if you think about it, pod means walk, pedestrian, right? Mm. So, yeah, if it's the same route. Yeah, uh, well, possibly. Um, doesn't work like this with Slavic languages. <laughs> oh, of course not. It's not a <laughs> Okay, we're not in Kansas anymore. <laughs> yeah. 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 Well, anyway, sorry. let's sorry. Let's switch from the linguistic part of a conversation to the art part of the conversation. We're, we're very well rounded yes. here at in the art scene, but yes, let's <laughs> let's get to the topic at hand. Yeah, some of those some of those can be very fun. Yeah, yeah. Cool. All we're right. all inter- international here, right? Yeah, so we are. And we are presumably going to be even more international because I don't know if we can reveal your plans yet. Go go for it. Yeah, Go for Angelique it. and her husband are moving in about six weeks to get their new permanent citizen, not residency in Portugal. Yes. So she will become a Portugal local artist. Yes. <laughs> and she's got some creative plans on getting her art business out there and uh, helping local community and having some fun with it. So, yes. Cool. Why don't we talk about that for a minute? If I can ask a two-part question. Sure. So why are you moving to Portugal and what impact will that have on your art and your, your business of art too? Uh, we are moving to Portugal because my husband is European. He's from Poland, as I said, and he would like to be closer to family. We would also like to have California weather with a quality of life. And Portugal offers both of those things. So that's why we decided on Portugal. Um, We'll just be a quick one and a half hour flight maybe from his family in case we need to get there quickly. As anybody who's been in Europe knows that everything's very close. So it's not any problem to get somewhere else to some other country very quickly. So I don't want to live in Poland because the weather, um, I can't deal with snow. So, and he loves the California weather. So that's why we're going there. Um, the, how's it going to impact my art? I'm hoping it doesn't impact it. I'm on a really good roll right now. (laughs) What does that mean? Tell Um, us about that good role. Well, right now I'm, you know, being accepted into exhibitions and I've got a lot of inspiration right now for things I want to paint. And I've got a jotted down list of things that are coming. I've got some collectors over here that are excited about my work, and I'm hoping that just because I changed continents, that doesn't change. Luckily, one of the exhibits I was just accepted into is in London, but it's a virtual exhibit, and I think because of COVID and so many people doing virtual exhibits, you can be anywhere at this point. So I think becoming an artist is internationally, I guess you would say, is a lot more easier than it probably would have been, say, five years ago, even two years ago. So, like I said, I hope it's not going to impact anything. If anything, I hope it gets easier because now I'll have access physically to more of the stuff over there. For example, I was invited by a gallery in Madrid. They wanted to represent me at the Liechtenstein Art Fair. And um, I wasn't able to do it because the cost of shipping my work over there and shipping it back for whatever didn't sell would have been astronomical. But now I can physically just drive it there. They're not going to be that far away. I mean, for Americans, as you know, like driving six hours, eight hours in the car is no big deal to us. Yeah, we just it's very. Yeah, we yeah. just did it driving back and forth from Sedona. So I have kind of a, a wild. Well, first of all, we should take a step back and clarify exactly what kind of art you do for our listeners, because none of them know yet. I guess we'll say that in the introduction. So maybe uh, we will have already covered that, but. Go, I do yeah, stuff we, like this. We see your background. Yeah, it's it's yeah. beautiful color. So tell it. So you are Thank a painter. You. Yes, I'm a painter. I do abstract. I don't want to call it expressionism. I don't want to call it impressionism. I it's just abstract. I, I follow what feels right. Sometimes there's a lot of texture. Sometimes there's not texture. Sometimes it's impasto. Sometimes it's poured. Sometimes it's about a feeling. Sometimes it's about a a thought. Yeah, I don't want to label it other than just abstract. And, you know, artists, we're always changing and growing. So things change. So why box yourself? That's true. That's true. So tell us about your process. And you sit down with a blank canvas and somehow over a course of time, choices are made as you're painting and it becomes a finished abstract. What happens from the beginning to the end? How does that become a piece? 
Well, it's interesting because right now, specifically, I am so focused on creating quiet. And I don't know what that means yet. I'm creating stuff that I think evokes a sense of quiet or a sense of peace or a sense of serenity. I think that especially with COVID, it was interesting because I worked from home and it was incredibly quiet all day while I worked and I enjoyed the peace and quiet. And I noticed when we went into lockdown, now everyone's home all day and my world got incredibly noisy, outrageously noisy. I didn't realize just how much noise there was around me. And then I really started paying attention to it. When you get in the car, there's unless you're in a Tesla or an electric vehicle of some sort, there's a lot more noise than you even are aware of anymore because we're just so desensitized at this point, which cars actually make a lot of noise. There's a lot of road noise, the, the wheels, the other cars rushing by, wind getting in the car because it's not sealed completely, that sort of thing. You're home, there's dogs barking, there's kids crying, there's people yelling at each other, there's car horns, there's wind rushing through the trees, there's birds singing, there's all of that noise. And I found that I was desperately trying to capture that peace and quiet again that I had been experiencing before because it felt very disruptive to me. And I would imagine it couldn't have been just me going through this. I, I, not just because I was working from home, but everybody's world changed drastically. And I don't think we had the same sense of peace that you might have had, even if it was just out of your routine. Now your peace is disrupted in some way. Even if that peace is just a routine that feels comfortable, it's still a sense of peace to you. Um, but the question is, what, what is quiet? It's for some people, it's complete silence with no noise at all. And I, can't, I don't even know where that is unless you're in a vacuum. For some people, it's just hearing the sounds of the birds. For some people, they need the city noise. The, they like the hustle and bustle. It's comforting to them. So that almost feels like quiet or serenity to them. I, I can't help but think of my cousin Vinny, that movie where he couldn't sleep until he was in the prison because now it sounded like New York to him. And that was his sense of peace and quiet. Um, but I don't even know what that looks like. Is it a texture? Is it, is it, uh, something on the painting that makes you want to touch it so that now you're pulled out of this world and it gives you a moment away from this? Is it a color? Is it a mixture of colors? Is it a depth? Is it uh, like, I'm so intrigued to explore this whole idea of what is serene? What is quiet? What does that mean in painting form? So that's where I am right now. That's what I'm playing with. What, what is what is the color of quiet? Um, yeah. I was going to make a, I have a comment and the question related to this. And the comment is, uh, I can relate to what you're saying because I grew up in a big city and the white noise of the street was somewhat calming. And when I came to California and we live in the canyon, so there are no houses behind us. So our... Mm -hmm master bedroom is looking over the canyon and i at the first few nights i literally felt like i lost my hearing because i couldn't hear anything and then all of a sudden there are coyotes from nowhere it's like oh well at least i can hear but that doesn't make me any more comfortable <laughs> <laughs> and it took me a while to actually get used to it and now if i am in the white noise of a big city now it makes me anxious uh, so mm. that that so you adjusted, sense, yeah. That sense is you know changing. It's it's the it's the adaptation. Uh, but the question I was going to ask you is that: Do you need to be in the quiet space to capture the quiet on your paintings, or you are still you know you have to work in the noisy environment, but still search for that uh, definition? I think I have become so sensitive to noise. And it's not just the, the average daily noises that we hear. If you think about it, we're barraged with noise when you watch television. It's just the advertising that's constantly, we're constantly bombarded with. I think of that as noise. You can't turn on a radio without hearing commercials. We're constantly given signals or information that you're not enough. You need to buy this product to make you better. That to me is incredible noise. So to me, I haven't found quiet myself. To me, there's always some sort of noise going on somewhere. So I look to that canvas 
like, I guess I'm trying to create it also for myself. I'm trying to find it within that canvas. And maybe if I find it for a moment, there's something about it, the color or the texture or something that draws me in for a moment that I forget where I am and what's happening. Maybe someone else will see that too and get to experience that as well. You know, I was just going to add that even in the complete absence of noise, if you will, if you have tinnitus like I do and a lot of other people do, when it's completely silent, you hear that. You're still hearing something in your head. It's not right. actual sound, but it feels like it. Right. So. So let me ask you guys, because I mean, this is a topic to me that I I'm very passionate about. I don't I don't know why I am. I'm not going to question it. But what do you consider? calm or quiet or serene because i'm i'm kind of i know those words have different meanings but to me i'm i'm trying to encompass that same space that space of peace and calm and so, where you just feel ease so what is that for you because for some people i hear it's the ocean it's the colors of the ocean or the sound of the waves for some people i'm hearing it's being in a forest and hearing a babbling brook and being surrounded by greenery so what is it for you guys well, I think to me, it's more of an internal experience rather than external experience. If I can be uh, okay by myself, it doesn't really matter what's going on around me. So, and that's, that, that's the conversation we had earlier uh, about quieting your mind. Can you do it uh, completely or you cannot, but can you actually stop engaging with it and let your mind rush, but, you know, be a passive observer and kind mm -hmm. of, you know, mind your own business. Uh, so to me, noise is when I am engaging with, when I'm in my head too much. And I okay. have a feeling that so many things are going on. Like it's loud in my head, you know? <laughs> right, right. <laughs> when I, when I uh, get a chance, whether through meditation or through experiencing some, I don't know. Inspiration does that to me, actually. This is why we went to Sedona, because I, I really wanted to soak in those colors and in the air and that the vibe uh, and the energy of Vortex. And when I have a chance to, you know, experience something like that, I kind of I kind of become that disengaged passive observer. And I and I like my mind is going its own way and I can mind my own business and do my art despite of what my mind is thinking if, if that makes any sense i don't know yes <laughs> but, yes yeah. it does it does and see if i can create a piece that pulls you out that you're now engaged with it instead of in your head then i've created that space of quiet for you I absolutely adore your new uh, blue series. It, it totally does feel calm to me. And it's it, it, that's that shade of blue that I'm really, really drawn to. Uh -huh. So yeah, it, it totally does. Thank you. Thank you. I yeah, haven't released I, I, it to the world yet, but okay. <laughs> <laughs> I think that color can evoke that same feeling of calm that a quiet uh, place can do. But I think it's a combination of things so like for me, I'm, I'm very musically oriented. I'm a musician. I guess every human on the planet is musically oriented. But in some contexts, having music is not good to have in the background for me. It's noise. In other contexts, the experience is much more sublime when there's music. So for instance, if I'm doing computer work, especially if I'm trying to write, I've got to have no other stimuli. I can't hmm. have music in the background. It's, it's just a lot harder for me to concentrate and focus. On the other hand, I have found whether it's meditation or doing another form of meditation, which is Tai Chi, that you can do those silently and many people do. When I add music to that experience, it changes it completely. It makes it this sublime, it transports me to another place and I'm completely calm and I'm in the zone and there's no other distractions whatsoever. So it, it, I think a lot of it depends on context. Some people mm -hmm. need that noise at night to sleep. Uh, jackhammers are a soothing sound for them during the day. Mm -hmm. It reminds them <laughs> of home. I don't know. So I guess 
to your point, Angelique, as you're exploring color and texture and and absence of color too, you know, that's what makes art is contrast. What can bring someone to a mental place that it reminds them of context where they feel calm and a, a mm-hmm. sense of quiet, regardless of the amount of actual measurable decibels that are going on in their space? Yes. I, I that, that's, that. that's my quest. Yep. I want to make a comment. Did you notice how, how Ron mentioned that he thinks that everybody on the planet are musical. Mm-hmm. Uh, you don't? Well, to the point, yes. But uh, I, as a visual artist, and I don't know if you share my opinion or not, I, I feel like everybody is visual. I don't. You don't? No, no. <laughs> I think everybody has both, but I think one is definitely dominant. Um, for example, I've done work with you and you used music. In the background, I did. While so we were doing both. For I some did. people, they could they couldn't have done that. Some people would have had to do one or the other. On the other hand, I I wanted you to visualize something, right? When we did that, mm-hmm. and I I found that uh, one one of the friends of mine who did the same class with me, she just couldn't visualize. She she doesn't even though she does uh, watercolor, mm-hmm. she cannot have uh, pictures in in her mind of from like any, uh, you know, abstract material kind of thing, or, you know, she cannot visualize things that don't, don't have a physical form. Right. Or I see movies in my head all the time. I do too. Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) But for music, speaking to what you were saying, Ron, for me, there's music that I can have playing in the background and I just end up tuning it out like white noise. And then there's music that is just, distracting for me so for me it even depends on the kind of music that's playing because some of the stuff it i get too engaged with it and i much rather pay attention to the music than pay attention to what i'm doing and there's other stuff i mean have michael put on some disco polo i can zone it right out because i can't stand it but you know just disco polo it's called disco polo yes it's a whole genre genre. i'm not familiar with disco polo you guys will have to look it up it's it's intriguing disco polo well we might have to find a prominent disco polo (laughs) artist to interview on this podcast for sure (laughs) there you go well don't tell them i said that (laughs) is polo like polish is this like polish disco or is it is it like water polo disco or what what does it mean no it's like polish disco i see okay so like Mm k-pop in a way yeah Okay. Exactly. Right. We're going to check it out. Yeah. Cool. That would be interesting. All right. Just go on just go on YouTube, type in Disco Polo. I'm sure there'll be plenty of things that pop up. It'll be fun to yeah, do that work. <laughs> so maybe we can talk a little bit about how you two first connected. Oh, well, uh, I don't know if that story is uh, any interesting, but uh, we, we at some point were belong to the same... Uh, membership group gallery uh and i kind of stuck around and angelique uh um parted left her, yeah <laughs> she left she she wasn't quite um i don't know I, i'll let you speak about that because you had a lot of mixed feelings about that place and uh, about people and uh, yeah i mean you had your own reasons to leave and i had my own reasons to stay uh, nonetheless, mm-hmm. we we remained, you know, connected and, and we became friends over time. Yes. Which has been awesome. Yes. I'm going to miss you. But we still have our clubhouse every Sunday. Yes. yes. We can keep doing Absolutely. clubhouse. Absolutely. So Probably we'll have to adjust the timing. Yes. Please. So, so um, as of April 25th, 2021, when we're recording this podcast, the both of you have been experimenting with a relatively new social phenomenon, which is called Clubhouse, which is meeting rooms that are audio only, where you can connect with anyone. But uh, in particular, a lot of celebrities are using it to connect with their audiences and their fans and whatnot. So it'll be interesting to see where we are a year from now, if Clubhouse takes off, if it's a thing. But maybe you can talk a little bit more about what you all are, are trying to do with Clubhouse. Absolutely. Um, What we wanted to do was create a forum where artists could come and celebrate their victories 
because a lot of artists, I live in families that don't have other artists in the family. So maybe you've finished something, you got accepted to something, you discovered something and you want to share the joy in the news and they just aren't going to get it the same way another artist is going to understand it. So I, we wanted to create a space for them to share their joys. And we also wanted to create a very safe space for people to ask questions. I've never used this material. Have I, Do you guys have experience with it? How do I use it? Because I think a lot of the art world is very intimidating. For whatever reason, it's been created around this energy of intimidation of um, we, we know something you don't and you're lesser because and we just wanted a space where people that that just doesn't exist. That energy just doesn't exist because we're all unique and we're all creating art that only we can make anyway. So we're all on an equal level. Um, and yeah, just having a safe space. Do you want to add anything, Galena? Yeah, well, it's called Art Catch Up because we are catching up on uh, our art week. So it's not not ketchup like mustard and ketchup. It's ketchup, well, right? It's called ketchup. What is ketchup? It's called ketchup. With yeah. a K? With a K, yes. Okay. It's art ketchup just because we thought we were being it would dorky. Be fun. <laughs> yeah. All right. Well, that's cool. But it is about catching up. I like ketchup up, a lot. So. But it is about catching up on uh, what, what have you done in your art week. Celebrate the victories and, uh, you know, have a little safe space with your peeps. Who can get what you're doing and get your struggles and and celebrate with you because it matters to them just as much as it matters to you. Yes. So Perfect. every sun every Sunday, 10 30 uh, Pacific time, art catch up on Clubhouse with Galena Marcus and Angelique Bacha. Yes. So please find us there. That was shameless plug. <laughs> not at all. It's not shameless. Well, I guess We'd we love to have you. Yeah, we are shameless about that. <laughs> no shame. We're happy to plug this. Awesome. Yeah. Well, let's get back to you and your art. Um, okay. <laughs> I were here. <laughs> if you forgot. So I wanted to uh, dive a little bit deeper into your process because you mentioned that you are exploring emotions and thoughts, and that's that's the basis for your uh, abstract. Uh, and I assume, you know, from my own experience that this is something, this is your internal exploration and the way for yourself to, you know, get to terms with certain things that you experience or find your joy uh, and make yourself a little happier person as a whole. Is that correct? Or is that something else uh, for you personally? So how... How does that process work for you? Where, how do you choose the emotions and um, how do you choose what to work on? Honestly, I think my art is actually meant for everyone else. When I want to create a sense of quiet or, for example, this painting behind me, shameless plug, just sold. You're not going to see it again. It's being shipped away. Oh. Um, this painting is called Trust. And this is back when I was using oil paints and everything has always been about ever since I started creating anything. And I've been creative my whole life. I've, I've made movies, I've written scripts, I've produced web series, I've drawn, I've, I've done a lot of different things. I've been a musician. Everything has been about putting something positive out into the world, something to make people feel better, feel happier, feel calmer, feel easier, feel prettier, feel whatever, because I feel like there's so much negativity in the world. I'm trying to counteract it in some way. I mean, there's even a lot of art that's very negative and very shocking and disturbing. And I understand that they needed to do that as their outlet. I get that. But for me, I want to inject something positive. So. These paintings, for example, my oil paintings, they were created from, I thought of a positive word, I meditated on that word, and then I intuitively let that come out on the canvas. That has all led to this sense of quiet, which to me is the bigger overall theme that I want to inject into the world. I want to give people a place to feel 
I want them every time they look at that painting to get that glimpse, even if it's just for a second of calm and serene. I don't know if I have a Superman complex that I feel like I need to save the world. I don't know if I just see so much negativity and I know how it affects me and I want to try to help the next person so they don't have to feel the way I felt. I, I don't know what it is, but it's not, I don't know that it's been about getting my stuff out. It's always been about trying to help in some way. So that answers your question. It does. Yeah. And it's a very interesting perspective. Well, I, I wonder how many artists feel that way that, you know, they're not just creating to create or to express or to make money. But in fact, every time they create a piece, they're hoping that it can serve as something that can help somebody else feel a sense of calm restore balance to their day, give them an anchor or some solace when they're facing a hard time, uh, take, make their space into a harmonious space that you come home from work, but you're in your house makes you feel good because it's got that piece of art in it. That just right. works perfectly for you. I have, to, I have to believe this is the driving force behind most musicians. It's a good point. It's an interesting point. I, you know, musicians, I, I will say on behalf of musicians that musicians love to play. They love to play. They love to explore and play is the right word. And they love to play together. At the same time, they also love to make audiences happy. Playing mm -hmm. in front of an audience uh, is a joy. And seeing the response of the audience to what you're doing can be a real joy. I, I think there's there's definitely an element of, of wanting to help other people with music. I, you know, I, I sort of feel like probably the same for any kind of artist. People do it for different reasons. So some people have a more conscious sense of that altruism and others are just doing it because they like doing it. And so I, I think actually it's kind of all over the map. And, you know, I'm not sure. I think, I think actually, Angelique, you bring up a great point. And I think some musicians are definitely into it for that. Uh, some actually use music as therapy, you know, um, mm -hmm. therapy tool. Um, so think about the, the heartbreak song that gets released that they wrote it because that's how they were feeling, but they know I'm not the only person that has ever experienced this feeling. And maybe this song's going to help the next person heal because they're going through a heartbreak right now. Absolutely. And that's I've seen many, I've heard many uh, artists interviewed who said, you know, it always makes me feel so good when someone says to me, Oh, you know, that song helped get me through that time. And uh, so, yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. So to both of your points, uh, I, I think that no matter what the intent is, the, the exchange of energy is always the, something that, that is most valuable in whatever art we're doing. Mm -hmm. That's a good way to put it, Galena, the exchange of energy. Mm -hmm. So when you create a piece of art, even if it's just a performance, you're actually exchanging, you're giving energy to somebody else yeah, in that I, process. Yeah. I can say for myself, if someone someone genuinely says that they're connecting with my art, I have, uh, whoever is listening, this is not how it works, but <laughs> I do have a rushing feeling to just give it to them for free because they're connected to it. And that's why we have no money. So if anyone would like to make <laughs> donations to us, we'd really this appreciate it because we're on our last meal right now. <laughs> This is why so many artists are starving. <laughs> <Exactly>. <laughs> because the energy is more valuable at the end of the day. Right. right. So pay us for our energy. <laughs> well, when you think about, you know, I mean, I've been hearing people talk lately about um, money is basically just a way to exchange, to have something to exchange for value. And so, you know, when you think about art is not just expression or something nice to experience, but it, it's actually something tangible of value. And, and obviously it is because why do we pay so much for entertainment? I mean, that's art. Um, it and, is. Yes. And we, we value it a lot. It's part of our human experience. It makes us feel good. It helps us get through our days. There's a lot of value in art. So when you create a beautiful abstract painting or you write a beautiful song uh, or you do a sculpture and someone buys it, and enjoys it and it helps lift their spirits there is value it is creating absolutely. value absolutely and what you're paying for is not only the feeling that you're getting but you're saying to this person 
I'm recognizing that you are the only person who could have created this because it's the culmination of their life experiences that inspired them to create this to begin with. And they're the only person that has had the life experiences and that specific sequence with those specific people in those specific places. Like nobody else has had that exact lifetime. So that sculpture came because of all the stuff that came before that they decided I'm going to sculpt this today. Nobody else could have done it. Now you're going to have people afterwards that realize the impact it has created and they're going to mimic it or copy it. And it's going to inspire them to do something similar. But that's also part of what you're paying for is the culmination of this person's life experience that they were so moved or touched by something that they had to get this out and share it with the world to pass on that energy. Here's my question. Early in the podcast, you talked about being able to do your art anywhere in the world. And in fact, it might even be better for you to be based out of Europe doing your art. And uh, a moment ago, you talked about someone being able to be inspired by a piece of art and then maybe uh, create their own art that is similar based on what you did. Mm And, Mm -hmm. um, and so it got me thinking about, and I know that you've dabbled just a little bit in this now and everyone's talking about it in the art world, the concept of the NFT, the (laughs) non-fungible token, which is a way to monetize an original, if you will, in air quotes piece that can be digital, but someone can own that original digital imprint and then resell it. And every time they resell it, you get a a royalty on that too. So maybe um, you can talk about what you've learned about NFT so far and and what you've tried. I have learned absolutely nothing. This is a whole podcast you need to do with my economist husband. He literally said, do you want to do this? I said, sure, let's give it, see what happens. I've never done it. I, he told me what to pick a piece of art to give him. I did. He set up the account. He handled everything. I just found out, hey, this piece sold and said, yay. And that's been the end of it. I can tell you that uh, for what it sold versus the fees that they charge, it was not worth it. If I'm going to do it again, I'm going to have to price the art much higher as the reserve because it's an auction. I know that much. So unless you set your price at a certain amount, you will make zero money because the fees they charge are silly. But that's a whole podcast. You guys would have a fantastic conversation about that. And he, it might help a lot of artists understand what it is and how to do it because he would be able to explain it to them in a way that would demystify. Yeah. And another shameless plug that uh, we are actually thinking about exploring this topic more in depth in the season two, which is coming very soon. <laughs> yeah, we'll be talking more about NFTs on this podcast. But do you think is there a is there a charge every time it gets resold or just that first time for setup? You know, I let me ask. Honey, is there a charge every time my piece of art is sold now for the NFT, is there ch- another charge? Do they continue charging service fees? If the person who bought my piece so it sells it, they now have to pay the same fees again, yes? They have to pay fees, I get a cut. Okay, so theoretically, if that piece keeps getting resold over time, you'll recoup your your initial setup fee and you'll start to make a profit, theoretically. Theoretically, yes. Okay, yes. all right. Well, we know that some people who are more like celebrities, like Jack Dorsey, who sold his very first tweet from 2006 or 2008, whenever it was, he just put it out there, here's my first tweet, want to buy it? And he made some ridiculous amount of money yep. for the very first tweet which was digital. He sold well, an NFT for that. And these places, or at least the one I dealt with right now, they're really pushing the celebrity stuff to the top of the pile because it's getting their name out there so that people will start using them. So, you know, somebody like me, it, it's easy to get buried. Your stuff's not going to get seen as easily because, you know, they're promoting all the celebrity stuff. So, right, right. And also, I think celebrities are easier to sell. Of and course. That's, that's the whole purpose of NFT. It's not about promoting art. It's about making money. It's it's like a virtual stock exchange, basically. Maybe. 
maybe. Well, I mean, how is that really any different than what a Sotheby's or a Christie's is doing? I don't know that they particularly care about art. To the extent of, you know, <laughs> increasing value. <laughs> yes. It's the investment. Yeah. Yes, exactly. We, well, I guess heard- that takes us, sorry, Angelique, I was going to say that takes us back to our earlier comment about starving artists, because are you doing this to create a commodity that you can sell, or are you doing this to create something that offers value to the world in a different way? Both. I I mean, I want to be able to pay my bills. I want to be able to buy art supplies. I would like to be able to eat and have a roof over my head, that sort of thing. While it sounds fun and nice to have Damien Hurst money or, you know, Jeff Koons money, I don't have to have it. I'm still going to paint. I'm going to paint whether somebody pays me for it or not, just because it's at this point, it's compulsory. I have to do it. It's just like a musician. You can't not play. You have to do it. But if people want to pay me a bunch of money for it, I'll take their money. I'm not shy. You know, I've said that many times (laughs) myself. If I I could actually get paid to do this, Mm -hmm. what a joy that would be. Yeah, well, I guess what we're trying to explore here is your understanding of success as an artist. So what, oh. what does feel more success to you? Is it is it about paying your bills and may, uh, being able to sustain your living from your craft, from, from what you do? Uh, or is it about having that energy exchange and seeing all those inspired people who connected to your art and found the feeling of quiet and whatever you were trying to uh, put out there in the world? Or is it anything else? It's anything, it's something else. And I've only realized this recently. I think in the beginning, success very much was to me uh, being able to sustain a lifestyle based on painting or whatever creative endeavor I was pursuing at the time. Um, It was very much about making your living from that. I have since found that what success actually means to me is I came from an environment that Anything artistic is absolutely necessary. We need that in the world. That's part of culture and history, and it's important. But it's a hobby. You have to be a very special person to be an artist of any kind. You have to have a special talent. You have to be a special, uh, you have to have special connections. You, there has to be something unique and wonderful and special about you to be an artist. Not, otherwise, everybody would do it. Everybody would be an artist. So this put a lot of limiting beliefs in me that, you know, it was, that I shouldn't bother painting, that I shouldn't bother creating because I'm not that special person. It's just hobby. Uh, Why would you do it? And it's a struggle. Look how many are struggling. Look how many people don't make it. Look how you have to die first, that sort of thing. And now I've realized that success to me is that I've got to a place where I don't care what they say. I don't care what they think. I don't care that this goes against everything that I was raised with, I'm going to do it because damn it, I love it. That makes me feel successful because how many people don't do something because of this voice of mommy or daddy or teacher or uncle or priest or whatever that parental figure was in your life, that important figure was in your life that was a naysayer. So you you let that talk you out of it. And I let that hold me back for an incredibly long time. And I've noticed that the more I'm letting that voice go and say, I don't care, you don't matter, your opinion doesn't matter, my opinion matters, the more I'm letting it go, the more success I'm having, the more financial success I'm having. Isn't that interesting? Mm-hmm. That's, that's a lesson for all of us. Don't try too hard. Do what you love and keep doing it. And yes. just keep doing it. And eventually and just, something is going to happen. Yep. That's yep. right. And uh, I love that you touched on the point of self-limiting beliefs and how they hold us back. And to the point that just getting rid of self-limiting beliefs is the success itself. Mm-hmm. And that's and right. It doesn't really probably doesn't really matter what you do in the world, whether it's art or any form of art uh, or anything else it could be i don't know can you imagine a doctor with self-limiting beliefs 
who's right? not performing surgeries as good as he could have because there's someone else better and everybody says that he's got a special talent for it and you don't. So, yeah. Right. I want that doctor who said, I don't care that you think I can't do this. I'm doing it anyway. I want the mechanic that says that. I want I want the, the chef that says that, you know, oh, you're a horrible cook. And they're like, nope, I'm going to prove you wrong. I'm a fantastic cook. Give me those people. That's what I want in the world. And I want to be one of those people. So, Well, I've, I've been told if you think you can or you think you can't, you're probably right. Yep. It's a very good saying. We've come to the point where this podcast is at our, our length. <laughs> There's a lot more to talk about with you, Angelique. And I think uh, we're obviously going to be talking to you again when you're in Portugal. Oh, yes. And multiple times, because we're going to want to hear how your art career takes off over there and what it's like to be an expat and what the European experience is for art, um, all sure. of that good stuff. And of course, once again, shameless plug for your I don't know if you call it a channel, your clubhouse, whatever it is. It, it's for now, it's a clubhouse room. And we for sure will keep discussing all those things and catch up on your progress as you transition to the European lifestyle and uh, art style. <laughs> <laughs> what was that or called art. again? The room? It's called Art Catch Up. So if you want to learn more about the process of adaptation and uh, experiences that Angelique is going to have uh, moving to Portugal and having all the new different experiences, finding new art supplies that don't exist in the States. Yep. Uh, yeah, so there will be a lot of transitions and I bet it will be very interesting. Uh, I can't I, wait. Yeah, it's, it's amazing. <laughs> Well, we wish you well. Obviously, we're going to be staying in touch with you all along the way. Yes. And so at this point, we want to thank you, Angelique, for making this podcast episode fantastic. Yes. Oh, thank you guys so much for having me. It was a lot of fun. Yes, it was long coming because I, I think we were talking about it for at least a year. Yeah, it yeah. has been a long time. <laughs> and for those That's listening, awesome. you can see uh, some samples. I think we'll have a couple of, of Samples of your art, I hope, uh, on our blog post, which will be on the intheartscene.com website. There will be a blog post that talks about this interview and, and more. And uh, of course, you can listen to this podcast wherever podcasts are distributed around the world, except for pandora.com. That's one place we're not at because yes. uh, because they are weird uh, advertisements <laughs> yeah. that we don't want to deal with anyway. So if you're a podcaster, you might look into that and see if it's for you. But anyway, tell a friend, make sure you refer us, check us out on our social media, and we will see you all soon. This is how we end every episode, Angelique. So you're actually part of our outro, which I kind of like. Maybe we'll start yeah. doing the outros in the live read. So maybe you can say it with us, Angelique. So we always say, and we'll see you, and then we get together scene. in the art scene. You want to do it together? Sure. Okay, okay, here we go. And we'll see you in, in the, the art in the scene. Art scene.